Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Darren Pytel, Davis's new police chief. Darren, I want to thank you for being on our show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. For sure. Darren Pytel is the definition of a Davis homegrown city employee. So let's start out by talking about before you were a city employee. I don't know if I can go back that far, but we'll try. So before you were a city employee, your mom was a city employee, and your dad worked for the high school. So let's start by talking about your mom and then talk about your dad. Yeah, so um, I actually grew up in Davis, and my parents moved here in 1968. My dad got a job at the Davis High School teaching, and I was born uh, the year after they got here. So uh, I did grow up in East Davis, um, near Birch Lane Elementary, which is where I went to school. Um, and it's actually, a lot of people think that my mom worked for the police department before me, but I actually started there before her. Uh, she started, uh, I think I was already a bike officer, and she started just soon after I became a bike officer. So we actually were both part-time employees um, at the police department for quite a few years. And as I uh, moved into full-time employment, she also moved into full-time employment. She started off as a, as a temporary part-time employee uh, working crime prevention. So uh, we actually were able to work you know, together um, for quite a few years. Um, but before she worked for the, the police department, my parents actually owned a store here in Davis. And she worked in their store for many years. And even when she worked at the police department, at least for the, the first couple of years, the store was still open. And, and uh, she worked there um, during the day uh, and then uh, went to the police department. A lot of the crime prevention stuff is done at nighttime. Huh. And so she was able to kind of balance the two. Um, but for many years when I was growing up, she actually didn't work, so which was really nice because uh, you know she, I have uh, three sisters and a brother and so mom just spent a lot of time, you know, taking us to all of the things that we did in Davis and, you know, was extremely active uh, in the PTA. And, and back then uh, they had groups, you know, faculty wives and things like that. So she was very connected to a lot of the other, uh, you know, spouses from the, the other teachers. So mom was real. She was always doing something. And uh, she was really a people person. And so she, she was very involved and loved to go out and loved to talk to people, which is why, you know, she really looked for that job at the police department because oh. doing crime prevention, it was, I mean, your entire job is going out and doing meetings and talking to people. And, um, you know, she really liked that. Um, so, you know, really that's uh, kind of what mom did. So uh, how many years did she work for the Davis PD? Oh, uh, probably 12 years. Well, somewhere, somewhere in there, she ended up uh, finally retiring. Um, you know, at some point uh, after Dad retired, uh, she wanted to retire, and they, uh, Dad, and Mom wanted to spend a lot of time traveling, and they were really big into traveling. Um, they would just get on the the train and travel all over the country, and just make stops in different places, rent a car, and uh, go out and see the the country, and then uh, get back on the train and go to the next stop. Um, they also love to go on cruises and so they spent a lot of time doing that as well so. so I was thinking about the best teachers in the history of Davis High and I came up with the name of a dozen teachers um, that's who I know about but your father's definitely on that list he was um, reputed to be able to teach anything yeah D dad knew something about everything and uh you know everybody that that's kind of one of the things that everybody would say is man i you know I, I had your dad as a teacher and he knew everything you ask him a question and and he would just kind of go off in lectures about you know all sorts of stuff um and uh you know and i know that because growing up in davis <laughs> it's, it's a small place and i cannot tell you how many thousands of times somebody said i know your dad you know and i had him for x class and you know, he had a lot of crazy kind of sayings and, you know, a lot of times they would kind of tell me and, and, um, but yeah, he's, he really, I think could teach everything. It, I th actually, I think he originally was hired to teach foreign language wow. and, and I'm like, 
why? Because <laughs> he, he really was kind of a history buff and then ultimately ended up in the kind of the social uh, sciences, teaching history, government, psychology, economics. When I, I know about when they, they made a special senior unit about economics, that was at a point in time that I was uh, somewhat involved in the curriculum in the high school. Uh, but the first I heard of the Pytels was that your dad was teaching a psychology class and people were just blown away that how good he did at teaching psychology and when it was the first time he'd ever taught it. Yeah, um, he actually didn't have a, a tremendous background. He was just extremely well read in psychology. And I think it was one of those subject matters he just really, really liked. Um, so he did a lot of reading and he taught it for a long time. I actually had him as a psychology teacher oh, wow. as well. So what it was like in high school for you? Uh, High school was, you know, I went to Davis High School, and um, I had, actually had a great time in high school. I had, uh, you know, it was, Davis was smaller back then. Yes. And quite a bit smaller. You know, and, and growing up, Davis was a lot smaller. So this is the one footnote I want to give you. I came to school here as a freshman in college 50 years ago. Yeah. It doubled in size from when I was a freshman until you were born. Right. And it doubled in size again between then and now. Yeah. And that gets us to over 50,000. I mean, we're at 65,000 now, but it was 8,000 when in 60 and it was 24,000 in 70. So that sounds about right because, uh, you know, my parents moved into East Davis and it was all brand new. All of East Davis, you know, was a brand new development, you know, which is ultimately where all my friends, you know, lived. And, uh, but it was a kind of that new section in town, the, and it wasn't until later that most of North Davis was built. And, and I remember that from when I was a kid. So, you know, Davis did just kind of grow up. Sure. Um, you know, but even back in the 80s when I went to junior high and high school, you know, the high school was still fairly small. Um, you kind of knew most of the people that went there. There was only the, you know, Davis High School. King was there, but it was very small. And um, so it was just kind of real different. Um, you know, obviously I knew all the teachers, you know, that was, and, uh, you know. They all knew they, you. They all knew me, um, you know, which was, it was actually really nice because a lot of the, the teachers that I had were teachers I had known my entire life. Right, you know? right. And uh, it, was, it was actually a really cool experience being able to take their classes, you know, after, after having, you know, grown up and, you know, had, they had been around it so many family functions and so many larger functions sure, in, in sure. town. The, you know, Davis has 60% biology students and PhDs in biology. I'm, I'm an economist, but I worked in the College of Engineering and there's more friction in the College of Engineering and in social science than there is in biology. So when a biology faculty holds a party and the kids come over, the other parents are really nice to the kids and they help them grow and develop and teach. Yeah. And so it's not uncommon that you meet a 12 year old who's having a conversation with a PhD about what they're studying. Yeah. It's what the PhD is studying because the 12 year old understands. Yeah. And that's you know a third of Davis. Yeah. So the other two thirds are av absolutely normal. So, <laughs> um, so any other comments about the high school? Um, I don't know really what to say about the high school other than, um, you know, it was, uh, well, I actually was able to take my dad for several classes, which was really interesting. The, uh, he, my dad had this way of testing that it really didn't matter whether he was dad or not, you know, and, and actually most of my, my brother and my sisters, you know, also out for classes. So I was able to take him for history, uh, government, psychology and um, you know so that was you know I really had a great time in high school um, good friends um, you know although most of my friends ended up moving away right after high school and you know and at that point I got hired at the police department you know soon after I graduated from high school and uh, so a couple of the the people that I grew up with actually still work at the police department um, you know so we kind of did that and you know lost contact with other people Although I've noticed in the past couple of years, I'm starting to see more and more people that I grew up with either coming back to town or, you know, um, they're stopping by more often. And it's kind of interesting running into people, you know, this many years later, almost 30 years later. 
Well, AARP put us number eight on the list of places to retire, and it's no surprise yeah. that all 10 are university towns. Yeah. So the support system that college students need is similar to the support system that older people need. Yeah. And you can draw negative conclusions from that as well <laughs> as positive. So. Um, so let's talk about your career in the PD. So you decided to become a cadet. Let's talk about that decision because everything flowed from yeah. there. So uh, back in junior high, I went to Holmes Junior High School. And um, you know, it was one of those, uh, back then uh, the, a group of cadets would come and try to recruit other kids into the program. And maybe twice a year they would show up at the, the junior high and do a kind of a lunchtime meeting and you know, anybody who is interested, you know, could stop in to the cafeteria and listen to what it is that was going on. Um, back then, the cadet program was really large. You know, there was uh, any at kind of the lowest levels, 20 uh, kids participating, and then there were times that there'd be 50, you know, kids in the program. So and what's the age range? The age range back then was 13 to 18. Okay. And so, uh, and I had just uh, turned 14. And uh, you know they came to the school one day, and I knew one of the the uh, cadets, and um, it was actually a, a female. Talked to her, and she's like, "Oh, it's really great, you know, and you can have a good time." So it was kind of one of those things. Have that, a good time. Yeah, and and uh, you learn learn about law enforcement, and there's always stuff to do. The meetings are fun and things like that. So I went to the the next cadet meeting at the police department. Okay, and it was fun. It was fun. Um, okay. The, co the cadet coordinators were really great. Uh, Don Brooks, um, who ultimately sure, retired sure, as a lieutenant, sure. he was a sergeant at the time sure. and, and one of the cadet coordinators. And you know, Don was great. He loved being around kids and you know was real active. Um, you know, trying to come up with stuff for us to do. And um, the Rick Gilbo, uh, he was yeah, an officer, yeah. and and ultimately he left and now does a lot of law enforcement training for across the United States. Uh, Manny Guerrero, sure, uh, who retired at Davis PD, and now he's actually an officer over at the University oh. uh, Police Department. You know, so the three of them were real active in the cadet program, and uh, you know, we met twice a month, and they always had you know different training going on, uh, so we could learn about law enforcement. They uh, back then they had cadets do just so many details. There was you know parades and traffic control and. Um, security functions and you know all sorts of stuff that we're involved in. We did uh, you know Some, check the schools. Sometimes just having a uniform yeah. in a body yeah. is a presence well, that prevents other things from. The happening. police department was very small back then, and so you know uh, half the size that it that it is now, and so a lot of times they just needed you know additional bodies to go out and and do all these events. Um, you know the the city. Uh, was never cash rich, so they weren't able to pay, you know, for personnel to do them and pay overtime for officers to do a lot of the details. So they really needed volunteers. And at the time, you know, between the the cadet program and the reserve police officer program, you know, volunteers were just doing a tremendous amount of work for the the city. You know, so I was able to, you know, kind of get involved, and I ended up donating just a lot of time to the cadet program. Um, you know, most of the years I was putting in over a thousand hours of volunteer time, uh, just uh, working. A thousand hours per year. Okay. Yeah. Good. So there are 168 hours in a week. So yeah. that would be like six weeks total time, yeah. 24 hours a day. Yeah. So uh, a full time. I'm employee, just saying that's. Yeah, it's a lot. A full time compared employee to going is, to school or or playing a sport. It's, yeah. It's the same as playing a sport at least. Uh, more than that, I agree. a, a full-time employee works 2,080 hours a year, um, in, not including you know. N then you start subtracting sick time and vacation time. Sure, but there, sure. You know the that is uh, 40 hours a week for 52 weeks is is and so I was putting in half of that you sure. know, volunteering. Sure. Um, there was just a lot of opportunities to to do stuff around the community and um, you know I had a great time doing it and a lot of my friends ended up. You know, being cadets, so it it was just kind of one of these things that we were all able to work together, and uh, the cadet coordinators were great. The department administration, you know, they were all really nice people to, to work for and very supportive. Good. You know, 
I actually felt very supported by all of the people in the department saying, you know, do good in school, you gotta go to college, you know, figure out what you wanna do, and you know, ultimately, if you wanna be a cop, you need to work here. So it was, it was just one of those things that uh, you know, everybody was, just kept on me, you know, being a cop's a good career. So now's as bad a time as any. What's the downside to being a cop? Well, you know, the, the hours take its toll. Um, you know, and certainly that's changed a little bit too in more modern, you know, times. Um, even in Davis, we deal with a lot of, you know, situations and, uh, you know, not all of them, you kind of see the, the other side of, you know, what occurs in Davis. And, you know, I've had to deal with a lot of, you know, really bad, terrible situations over the, the past, you know, 29 years, you know, and uh, so some of that takes its toll. Um, the, you know, more modernly, it's just the amount of time that you have to devote to doing the job. You know, back uh, in the, the 80s and 90s, you know, when you were off, you were off. And then they they made those pagers. You know, <laughs> that, that was the that was the worst piece of technology ever, um, because then we had to carry a pager around, and you're expected to, to you know, when the when the pager went off, you had to call in and, and show up to work. And the smartphone is just yeah. an extension. And, of yeah. That now pager. now we have pager. the the iPhones, yeah. and you know people are texting 24 hours a day, and people are sending emails, you know, all day and night. You know, back then. Um, you know, on Friday at five o'clock you left and nobody expected an answer until Monday morning, you know, and now, you know, people are wanting information seven days a week and wanting to talk and, you know, wanting things done. So just the pace at which we have to operate now is just a lot greater. That's number one. Number two is the whole world changed on 9-11. Yeah, it did. Um, both good and bad. You know, there's the, the, I think we get a lot more support after 9-11 and, uh, you know, people actually um, pay attention and have an interest in uh, security and safety. Um, I think in some ways people are more understanding of some of the, the things that we do in order to, you know, ensure public safety, you know, and, and obviously the bad, um, you know, certainly the, the flip side of having safety and security is people are really concerned about, you know, civil rights and privacy. And, you know, we end up going to a lot of meetings to talk about the balance between the two. How is it that you keep people safe, but also respect people's privacy and, uh, you know, deal with things of, you know, profiling or people, you know, looking at, at others differently, um, sometimes because of, uh, you know, national origin and, and uh, you know, just the color of somebody's skin. So the, the whole point of the law enforcement system and the court structure is to mediate that debate between freedom of individual action, the right of a group of people to do things, and protecting the majority and the innocent bystander. Yeah. And mediating that. It, it's a, it can be a very difficult balance. The, the most powerful experience I had in politics was up at Fort Bragg, and we were demonstrating on behalf of the Redwoods, and there were a bunch of people that were dressed in yellow. And, and they were drunk, and there were a thousand of them and a thousand of us, and there were 400 CHP and deputy sheriff that formed a fence yeah. between the two groups down Main Street in Fort Bragg. And the turning point was when one of the demonstrators said, we've decided there's been so much good communication that we're not going to get arrested. And at that point, the fence sagged because the police felt safe for the first time. Yeah. But that's how much you're putting your life on the line every day you put on the uniform. Yeah, that, that balance and, and uh, you know, feeling that safety and security, um, you know, at times uh, you don't feel it. You know, and, and there's been plenty of times when we're on a line here, you know, we have a lot of demonstrations and, you know, sometimes you, you feel like, okay, where's this going to, you know, what can go wrong and, you know, where's this going to explode? So, that, yeah, that happens. That's why you have training. We do have a lot of training. I think firefighters may have more training than you do, but it's right up there in terms of if you can anticipate a problem and figure out how to solve it ahead of time, 
you're on you're ahead of the game compared to this situation. So. Yeah, the amount of training over the past couple of years, you know, has just greatly increased. Um, you know, police under th there's just so many more expectations. Um, you know, the, the level of scrutiny that law enforcement's under now, it, it, you know, it's unprecedented. The and for good. Um, you know, now everybody does. If have we're their, doing our job, yeah, everybody does have it. their smartphones. Yeah, do it our job. Yeah. Just do your job. So people are recording law enforcement and, and seeing what what's been going on, and you know it ends up on TV. And so now you have America and the and the world kind of viewing what law enforcement's been doing all of these years, and so it has created additional scrutiny. But a lot of it is good. Um, but the the you know law enforcement's had to train to a higher standard, um, you know, which is also a, a good thing. People are questioning now what what it is that we do and use of force, and everybody's asking you know really good questions about is is there a better or different way to do this? Well, that's an important part of the social discussion that has to go on. I mean, as I've studied Robert Peel a little bit, the guy who transformed the British Police Service, and that was 150 years ago, and they're still doing it that way, but. They, you know, they still teach Peel's principles in the academy. That's in the in the very first week. Well, I don't know what they are, but I assume that they're very powerful. They are. They they. Uh, it's kind of interesting because those principles translate perfectly today, Good. which is why they're still taught Good. in the the first learning domain in the police academy. Good. Do you mind giving me a lightning summary of an example? You know, basically, uh, really, the principles are all about community policing you know, and, and policing to the community and law enforcement being held to a standard in the community. So each one of them is directly relates to that, which is exactly what it is that the communities are asking, you know, law enforcement across the country is to engage in community policing. So it, it's just, uh, you know, community policing was really big um, for in periods in, in history. And as, you know, the population kind of grew up in the, or, or, you know, grew in the 90s, you know, law enforcement agencies started to become more entrenched and community policing, you know, took kind of a, a back seat, you know, and then certainly in the last couple of years, everybody's saying, okay, where are these cops and why aren't they walking down the street? Why don't they know the community? You know, why aren't they talking to people? And, um, you know, so it's just a, we're back to, you know, something that was, you know, well, happening back in the 1800s in, in England and and certainly in a lot of places in the, the 50s and 60s and some, because there was also a lot of you know, civil unrest in, in sure. the 60s, but um, you know, community policing was, was being practiced in many places. And then uh, you know, here we are right back to trying some of the same stuff that was used back then. Well, the least efficient police system would be one cop for each citizen. <laughs> So the most efficient would be the smallest police force. And to a certain extent, you use technology to magnify and amplify your ability. But there's no way you can manage crime. You can only anticipate where there are going to be problems and try and address them on a timely basis. Yeah, that's actually the, uh, what you just described is currently how we're trying to police. So we've, the, the next step after community policing is, okay, what is your policing strategy? And then how is it that you're identifying where problems are? So, you know, we started off many years ago saying, okay, Davis, we, we're gonna practice community policing. And, and that's having the, the personal relationships and interacting. And then you have to pick a, on top of just saying that's our philosophy, you have to then say, okay, what is our policing strategy and how is it that we're going to, you know, identify and deal with problems? So, you know, now uh, progressive law enforcement agencies are moving into intelligence-led policing, you know, which is, okay, there aren't enough cops to deal with all of the potential issues. So, you know, what are the, the issues that we're going to focus on? So you have to identify those either and, you know, really what we do is look for what are the hot spots and who are the hot people? you know, that are out there engaging in crime and then trying to focus, you know, resources. Um, so you use community oriented policing and problem solving. And the problem solving is just going out and arresting somebody doesn't solve the problem. Mm, usually so it makes it worse. It does, and it can make it worse. So you have to come up with other strategies in order to, you know, reduce those problems. 
So you know we have to be smarter and better, you know, at, at what we do. So you know we've moved from you know just community policing and that kind of philosophy to um, you know including problem solving and creative problem solving now, and then using intelligence led policing to to help us you know move our resources to to where it's most appropriate. So in terms of my having a plan for this conversation, we got off track and started talking about reality, but uh, <laughs> it was wonderful. So um, you became a cadet. I'm, I'm going through your career. I'm oh, using yeah. that as a little bit of structure here. So, so you were a cadet, and then you got hired full time. You became a, a bicycle officer. I what did. was the sequence so of that? So the, the sequence Graduating of from high school and going to college. So all of those things came together. So I, I think probably by the time I was 16, I decided I really want to be a cop. And uh, so back then, there was basically two routes to becoming a cop. The, there was one route, which is you go to the police academy. And state law just says you have to be 18 to, to be a peace officer in California, although nobody really hires 18-year-olds. You know, most agencies set a minimum age at 21. So uh, but Davis was. You know, I knew all the administration. They're like, you'd be a good cop, um, but I really wanted to go to college. So I started a uh, well. It first started that I wanted to be a cop. So when I was 16, um, I signed up for the other route to becoming a cop, which is going through the back then the reserve academy. Okay. And so reserves were you know unpaid for the most part, and you would still be a peace officer, but the training was different. So that back then. Uh, you could become a, they, there's different levels of reserves, mm -hmm. but you could become a level one, which is basically a, a full peace officer um, with only 240 hours of academy training, followed up by 200 hours of on the job field training. Mm -hmm. So when I was 16, I decided that I wanted to, to be a, you know, a cop. And uh, so I decided to go to the reserve academy. Well, the Reserve Academy training was in Sacramento, and it was affiliated with uh, Sacramento City College. So I applied, and then had to get special permission from the dean to go through the academy, because I was only 16 and just about to turn 17. So I had to take uh, the placement exams, and I tested you know, great to get in the academy. And the dean of Sacramento City College actually gave me permission to you know, go through the program you know, before I was 18. So I went and uh, did my 240 hours of classroom instruction and then uh, started applying. You know, I applied at the police department on my 18th birthday, which is in, was in February. Huh. So I was still a senior in high school and had already completed the, the classroom portion. The academic coursework for yeah. an AA degree. Uh, no, not for an AA, but it was, I think it was 18 units to go through the, okay. the academy. Okay. So, um, so by this time, you know, I knew that I wanted to work at the police department, had applied to be a reserve officer, and then I'd also, you know, of course I wanted to go to college, so I started applying at colleges, and I really only applied at Sac State. You know, they had a great criminal justice program, yes. and I decided yes. I wanted to major in yes. criminal justice. So I applied at Sac State and, uh, you know, got accepted at Sac State, had already finished up the reserve academy. Then I, it was just a matter of graduating from high school. So I graduated because well, you need a high school diploma in order to be a cop, including a reserve. Sure. Um, and so right out of high school, though, um, I wanted to go do something different for the summer. So I actually went and worked as a camp counselor for a campfire camp and did that for two months. And uh, then when I was at camp, I got a phone call from the bike officer who uh, was a cadet with me for many years and then became a bike officer. He called me up. Uh, well, actually left a message with my mom who got a hold of me and he said, hey, I'm actually gonna be quitting the job. If you wanna be a bike cop, you should go in and talk to the department. So I'm, I said, I actually would love that job. It's a great job to go to college. And uh, so back then, it's a little bit different. It was a little different getting higher than it is now. I, I uh, went into, at the time, uh, Captain Walt Nars' office. I know Walt. <laughs> yeah. You know, so Walt would had been there forever, and Walt sure. knew me. You know, uh, he actually used to live on the same street when I was growing up, 
And so I walked in his office and I said, I hear that the bike officer position is going to be, you know, opening. And, and he said, yeah. And I said, I would love that job. And I, and I said, I will be a great bike cop. And he said, he just kind of looked at me and he said, you probably would, kid, you're hired. Wow. And so What an interview. It was. Uh, so, But it, you, no, no, you'd been interviewed for five years. Yeah. At, at that point, everybody knew yeah. what I was doing. Yeah, and, they uh, knew what, what you were, they were getting. So uh, Walt walked me down to uh, the chief secretary's office and said, Darren's going to start when, as soon as he's done with camp. And uh, we did the paperwork, and I went. Right there on the spot. Yeah. And then you uh, rode home and went, Mom, guess what? I got, yeah, the I got job. a job at the police department. And, but she uh, knew about it. She understood. She gave you the information. Yeah. So then at that point, I was kind of set up. I was for the fall. I came back from camp, had my job waiting for me, and was starting college at the same time. So I would go and uh, go to school you know, for a couple hours in the mornings and then come and work. So, and, it, and back then I was a reserve and a bike cop. So I worked as on a bicycle for 20 hours a week and I worked in a patrol car for 20 hours a week. And in the patrol car, what did you do? Patrol, so I would uh, basically- So you had a car to yourself? No, originally I was working with an officer, you know, in field training and I did the field training program and doing it half time took about a year. Okay. And then, uh, you know, about a year later, I was done with the field training, and yeah, then I was working in a car by myself. No, the, a, yeah. a year of training is great. Yeah, so. Um, I mean, you know, the, my understanding is that it's, after you've done the academy, it's a six weeks process. The first two weeks, the training officer makes all the decisions. The second two weeks, you make all the decisions, but you can talk to the training officer in the third two weeks, you can't talk to the training officer and they're grading you, Th and it's that, Well, tough. that's way back. Okay, I'm so, just saying that's yeah, what I know. Yeah, now the, the, well, actually, even back then, the training program was about five months in length, okay. full time. You know, now Great. it's actually up to about six months full sure, time. Sure, sure. So, it, you know, it's actually a lot more, there's just a lot of training that has to be done, you know, out on the field. So I was able to, uh, you know, finish up the training. Um, stayed on as a bike officer and you know that was helping pay the bills i had to work a couple of other part-time jobs along the way uh, there uh, i actually was a waiter at denny's in woodland for a while um, while i was a bike cop and a reserve so it was and i had to pay my tuition um, and so uh, i did that and then at some point i just said you know i really want to just go into kind of the full time um, you know, officer position. So I took a semester off of school at Sac State and then had to go back to the academy to finish out the training. And so that took a couple of months. And, and that put you back on the original track? Yeah. So then uh, right after, actually about halfway through the academy, um, applied to be a regular police officer. And uh, you know, Walt Nar was still, you know, doing the iron, and he said, well, okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, at, and at that point, um, you know, it was just a matter of going through the, the oral board, and, you know, I passed the oral board, and uh, they let us know, yeah, we'll hire you right out of the academy. So I started, you know, I, I think I graduated from the academy on, like, October 30th and started full-time on November 1st. Sure. So, and at that point... Um, I'd already been through the entire field training program, so transitioning from, you know, temporary part-time bike cop reserve officer to regular police officer, I didn't have to do any additional training. You'd really been going through the transition yeah, for a long for time. A You'd years. already plateaued to the point that people are expected to be out when they're given patrol assignment. Yeah. So I was able to start working the night shift right away, um, went back to finish out Sac State. And uh, you know, graduated from there uh, soon after. So to, everything at that point was just kind of falling into place. So, how long were you in patrol? I I only worked for patrol uh, for about a year and a half at that point, and then uh, a position as a motorcycle officer right, came up. Right. And uh, and I ne had never really ridden a motorcycle before, 
but I love traffic enforcement. And so, and because I had already worked as a bike cop, and it's that's just traffic. Right. And uh, you know, as a patrol officer, I loved working traffic. Uh, just kind of one of those things that I enjoyed doing, uh, going out there and you know writing tickets and uh, you know making the roads safer and um, investigating traffic collisions and things like that. So I put in for the motor position, and they said great, and I got the the position. Had to go through motor training, which Absolutely. was the the motor training is some of the most difficult training that that cops can do. It was about six weeks. Um, it started, the, the worst part is it, is it started at the beginning of the summer, you know, so you're out there riding eight hours a day, you know, in 100 degree, 105 degree heat. And it was just, and the, the training itself is just really difficult. Um, having to ride and, and do all the precision uh, cone patterns and things like that, it was just really difficult. But I made it through the, the initial part of the training and then the, the final testing and you know, and then in August, uh, you know, I was hitting the street, you know, as a, a motor cop. So I did that for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, looking back in my entire career, that was the fun time. Really? It was. Uh, riding a motorcycle around Davis and, uh, you know, it was just, it was such a great job. You know, you have to, you know, work traffic and, uh, you know, you stop people and, you know, you give a lot of warnings and you talk to a lot of people and, you know, you write some tickets and investigate some traffic collisions and, you know, go to schools and give talks about education and, you know, and you just get a ride around and you get a wave to everybody and you just, you know, that's a, that was one of the positions you're extremely visible. Yes. Everybody wants to talk yes. to you. Well, you know, so people, you know, when you're sitting there working radar, you know, people just stop and chat and want to talk about the motorcycle or what you're doing or, and it was just, you know, a really great time. Good. So that was the only part that I hated was riding in the middle of the summer when it was really hot and riding in the middle of the winter when it was really cold. But eight months a year, it was fine. <laughs> so then you made sergeant. I did. So I was still a motor cop and a sergeant's position came open and I was really young. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'll go ahead and put in for it. Never expected to get promoted, but it's the, uh, I constantly tell people you should test for positions when they come open because you just get better at the interview process sure, sure. the more that you do it. Sure. And so, you know, I thought, okay, I'll go through the oral board because I had never been through that type of, you know, uh, promotional oral board, which is harder and different. And, um, well, I got promoted. <laughs> the, so talk about the responsibilities of sergeant and how they're different than being a patrol officer. Yeah, so I, uh, after I got promoted to sergeant, I immediately went to the night shift. And I worked on the, the busy side of the week, which was the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. And we had gone to, by that point, we had gone to 12-hour shifts. So being a, a brand new sergeant, you're working the night shift. Well, back then there was no administrators that worked the night shift. Admin went home at five o'clock. You know, we came to work at six o'clock and we left at six in the morning and admin didn't show up till eight in the morning. And the reality is, is the, the night shift sergeants basically, you know, they run the public safety for, for Davis and um, you, you really didn't call administration out and, unless it was something really, really serious. And even then, most of the time back then, they would just say, all right, sounds serious, you know, good luck. <laughs> you know, do the best that you can and let me know how, how it works out. I'll find out in the morning. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so, and we were really busy. You know, the downtown, the, so stuff is happening downtown with the bars. It was busy back in the 90s, just like it's busy now. Um, so we, we had a lot of stuff going on at, at downtown and, you know, all of the, the good stuff happens at nighttime. So I was able to run a small shift there. Were, I think there was seven officers assigned to the, to the shift and I was a sergeant, um, had a, back then had a great team. The, the, back then it was, it's a little bit different now. The most experienced officers actually worked the graveyard shift. It was kind of fun and, uh, you know, a good solid tight team and people just really like the activity level at night. And so the, 
the most experienced officers in the department really were, were some of them on, on night shift, so, which was really good for a new supervisor. I had a, a couple of guys that had been cop for quite a few years and you know, had been on you know, SWAT and had done investigations and different assignments. So you know, when something happened, I had, I had a really qualified personnel who could basically get us through. Well, they did get us through everything that happened. So I just want people to get a sense of the, I've got to tell this story. So Phil Coleman was the police chief and Bob Traverso was the city manager and they were best friends. Yeah. And so there was a red phone in the police chief's office on his desk and it was to the city manager. And they were best friends. Well. I'm meeting with the police chief, and the phone rings. Well, the police chief knows that the city manager, his best friend, is out of town, and so it's not his best friend. It's somebody else on the red phone, and he stares at it, and it rings again, and he picks it up, and it's the assistant city manager, and she's in charge. And there's a robbery at 2nd Street at the AMPM Mini Mart, and the chief says, Jesus called the sergeant and <laughs> hangs up the phone. I, I just want to convey the sergeant is the one in charge of making it happen now. Yeah, so Phil was the, the chief, and, um, and Phil actually brought a lot of rules. He, he came from Oakland Police well, Department. Oakland, and, yeah. And, and so Phil was really the, the chief that said, oh, hey, we need rules in this department, and we need to start writing things down, and... and uh, he was really great at that. But one of his roles was, um, in the absence of higher authority, the watch commander, the sergeant, they're in charge. They're the chief. Absolutely. And, and we actually still have Phil's role today. <laughs> it's a great role. Well, my dad was in the military police. He became the provost marshal at Oakland Army Terminal. He went through officer's candidate school. He was late in getting into the officer's candidate school, so he spent an additional period as a corporal. He think, uh, like a month, an additional month as a corporal before he went to be an officer. He always relied on the sergeants more than the other officers yeah. did because he knew what they were capable of doing. Yeah, it, you know, from the time that I was a sergeant to even now, um, you know, what I constantly tell people, the sergeants really run the show. You know, so people call 911 and they call the police and really what they want is a cop to show up. Well, it's really not administration that shows up and handles, the, handles those calls. It's really up to the sergeant to make sure that the, the officers are out there doing what they're supposed to do. So, you know, I'm constantly telling people, it's really the sergeants that are running the show. Probably the most important position in, in the entire department. Exactly. As far as how day-to-day -day operations are run and and uh, you know how it is that we provide service. So yeah, the, the sergeant's position is just a really important position. So that's a segue to lieutenant and captain. What's the responsibility of the high-ranking officer? So the, at our department, the, the lieutenants are division commanders. So like patrol, uh, we have a patrol commander who's a lieutenant, and they're, they're responsible for all five of the patrol shifts. So we have five different shifts, five sergeants who run each one of those shifts. So you have a, an administrator who you know, basically ensures that all of the shifts are kind of operating the same, all the sergeants are on the same page, um, and taking care of all the, the personnel issues that arise from that. And then for real critical incidents, um, you know, when you need to call in additional resources, then we have lieutenants go out and they assume field command. But most of the time, probably 99% of the time, it's a sergeant that's doing that. So the biggest problem that we probably should talk about is uh, social life in the downtown and how it can be good for the kids and it can be good for the rest of us. Yeah. So why don't you talk about the balance between the different concerns and what your feelings are about where we're headed? Yeah, so, you know, really, downtown is interesting because, like I said, downtown's been busy for as long as I can remember, you know, going back to the days when I worked, uh, you know, which was the early 90s. 
and uh, you know we had issues and you know we had a couple of bars down there and they were really crowded and we had a, a lot of students down there drinking and we dealt with bar fights we dealt with drunken public we dealt with you know all of the DUI and all of the other things associated with with drinking you know for the most part though the violence that we had was it was really limited to kind of bar fights and there wasn't there weren't too many really serious incidents and we weren't really dealing with gang members and you know weapons except for what ended up happening at the grad um, the, grad. So the graduate so when was so, that? so back in probably the mid 90s okay the graduate was starting to get really busy okay. and we we ended up dealing with um, back then a lot of gang members would come in uh, and they would show up for for uh, you know Friday and Saturday nights and we ended up having some pretty serious incidents you know including uh, you know some violence against us you know I remember one of them uh, there was a big fight and all of a sudden they just started picking up the big rocks that were in the planters and we were getting big river rocks thrown at us you know we started dealing with more and more incidents over there well we ended up ultimately we ended up working with uh, the owner and manager there and you know they brought in additional security and you know over some period of time and some efforts with ABC it, they were really kind of able to change things around and we ended up dealing with just you know fewer and fewer issues there and you know for the most part downtown has been really busy you know during that kind of interim period and then just in the, the past couple of years, we've been trying to, you know, put it on the radar, let everybody know downtown's busy and we're starting to deal with, you know, more and more incidents where we're seeing some weapons, we're dealing with gang members again, um, things were kind of picking up and still dealing with a lot of alcohol related arrests, you know, the kind of the usual. Well, a couple of things have, have happened. The, the first thing um, that we kind of started seeing were there was a couple of bars downtown that were, you know, attracting really large numbers of people and including, uh, and they would have lines. So you'd end up having to deal with two or 300 people waiting in line uh, because there weren't that many establishments downtown. And then we started dealing with all of the problems that occur when you have people standing in line for a long period of time with drinking. really no hope of ever getting in the bar. And they're drinking. And well, they're drinking. Yeah, they're, back then we didn't have an open container. Yeah law so you know the the standard was uh they would go to to the market there at second and b street grab a couple of 40 ounces and then they would go stand in lines at the bars drink and uh you know wait to get in so we started you know having to deal with a lot of fights because of that beer bottles being broken you know public urination and so we started kind of rethinking you know our strategies on uh, reducing problems and one of the things that we were doing was kind of denying the, the the ABC permits for new businesses that wanted to come in and so we actually took a look at that and said well you know if we had more establishments we'd probably have fewer line problems people would actually be inside of a business under the control of the the bouncers the and, proprietor yeah and so and it you know it was really logical so we started you know approving more and more ABC licenses downtown and it actually did solve that problem we were moving people off the streets and kind of into the bars and you know for the most part most of the bars don't have problems and they have good staff and they're able to control things well over the, the past uh, you know year especially the we're kind of seeing a change a little bit in in uh, who shows up at the bars and we've seen a little bit of change in party behavior in Davis so and it's all kind of all related so it used to be that we had very large parties drinking parties in the residential areas in town uh, you know back when I was on patrol on Thursday Friday Saturday night it was not uncommon to go to parties where there was you know 500 to a thousand you know people uh, who had taken over an apartment complex and were partying and you know being loud and lots of drinking going on that was pretty routine <coughs> and it was pretty routine that we would show up and break up the party and you know write some noise tickets and everybody would go on their way the well now uh, we don't deal with 
those large parties. And the, the number of noise calls that we get is really dropped significantly. We still have them, but we're just dealing with far, far fewer parties. And you think that's because <laughs> there are more bars downtown? Well, I think that there's more bars downtown. But we're also seeing a change in culture with the students. So the, you know, the, you brought it up, the kids now are smart. And the, the average student, uh, you know, their drinking is, it's just not part of what it is that they do. They're, they're taking their studies serious. These are 4.0 students who are getting into UCD. So we're just dealing with fewer drinking problems for the most part. So we're, we're dealing with that change. <coughs> Sorry. So, so the, the bars just weren't as busy with students, I think. And now we're dealing with people coming in from out of town. Right. That aren't that, they aren't worried about their 4.0 grade point. No, they're not. <coughs> so, um, the, Darren Pytel has just been named the chief of the Davis Police Department by the city manager. Um, he's in the process of selecting his uh, management team. I originally asked him to talk about the future of the Davis Police Department, but he said he's not ready to do that because he wants to meet strategically with his team and come up with a new plan now that he's the chief. So I hope that you'll come back on the show in six months and give us an update on the status of your department and what your plans are for the future. I can, and as a matter of fact, I just sent out an email to all the department staff um, I've uh, promoted a deputy chief today. Congratulations. So, so uh, uh, Lieutenant Ton Fan's been promoted to deputy wow. chief. Wow, well, that, that makes this news. I'm, yep. I'm sure it'll make the newspaper before it gets on the air, but yep. congratulations. That's a very important decision. It is. Um, any last words? No. Uh, we'll be going to city council um, here pretty quickly to start talking about some of the, the issues downtown. Absolutely. Um, pay attention, get involved. I'm sure the chief wants to hear what you have to say. Um, I want to thank you for being on our show. Thank you. Uh, this has been What's Going On. Thanks for watching. Good evening.